I'm Jan Painter, and I would like to welcome you again to our program, Politics Matters. Our topic for discussion today is the issue of the protection of free speech and civil liberties, and we are very pleased to have as our guest John Whitehead of the Rutherford Institute. Welcome, Mr. Whitehead. Hey, thank you. John Whitehead is an author and attorney with long experience in the areas of human rights and constitutional law, having received a BA from the University of Arkansas in 1969 and a JD from that same university's School of Law in 1974. In 1982, he founded the Rutherford Institute, which is located in Charlottesville, Virginia. He is a vocal defender of the rights of others, transcending partisanship, and has written extensively in print media while also speaking out frequently on radio and interviews. He has authored numerous articles and books, including most recently in 2009, Stand Up and Fight, It's Time for a Second American Revolution, and The Freedom Wars, published in 2010. In 1991, John Whitehead won the Hungarian Medal of Freedom. He is a participating member of the Constitution Project, which works to forge bipartisan agreement for solutions to legal and constitutional issues. He is also on the advisory board of the Innocence Project, which challenges wrongful convictions in the criminal justice system. Having our voices heard is a closely held and cherished right of every American, going back to our founders and those hard-won freedoms that they made possible for all of us. All too often, however, and at our peril, we take freedom for granted, yet our Bill of Rights, and in particular our First Amendment, with its vigorous emphasis on freedom of speech, the right of peaceable assembly, and our right to petition our government for redress of grievances, is increasingly on the minds of many citizens as we move ahead into the second decade of the 21st century. As the inheritors of a democracy with institutions intended to safeguard our rights and liberties, when and where do we draw the line between necessary institutional function and security and the rights of an individual to exercise his or her individual constitutional prerogatives. Speaking out while at the same time not drowning out the voice of our neighbors and fellow citizens is often a precarious and delicate balancing act. This is something most parents teach their children, as yet as adults. We often lose sight of this idea of mutual respect as we strive to make ourselves heard. The rights of the many versus the few. This is the ground on which we have fought many battles throughout our nation's history. Our guest today has devoted his career to the principle of the protection of the individual's right to free speech in all its forms, freedom of religion, freedom from harassment and discrimination, freedom of assembly, to name just a few. And we are very pleased to have him here with us for a conversation about renewing our commitment to freedom. Welcome again, Mr. Whitehead. What brought you to your strong commitment to the issues of civil liberties and civil rights? Uh, I came out of the 1960s where I was a, essentially a left-wing Marxist. Um, and um, you know, over a period of years, you know, uh, went, to, you know went to law school, um, just basically uh, it was those early struggles and then some key mentors along the way, one being Nat Henhoff, who's the legendary civil libertarian that wrote for the Village Voice, is still a good friend of mine, um, and a number of people that I would read and just research. And um, uh, I don't know, I, my parents, my mother was always standing up for people, and I think I modeled a lot off of my mother, who was always in the middle of some kind of brouhaha or argument with somebody over some kind of issue. So I had, you know, mentors and people along the way. Um, and just basically research into the history of America. I'm a big fan of Thomas Jefferson, whom I thought, you know, Thomas Jefferson had his faults, but great civil libertarian, James Madison, people like that. Um, and, you know, my study of history, very, very influential, but just getting involved. You know, I was an anti-war activist in the 60s, um, and I saw firsthand what a good movement can be and how effective it can be. The anti-war movement was very, very effective. It accomplished what it, what it wanted to accomplish at that time, which was the end of the Vietnam War. 
And um, uh, I have also to be a Christian, and I believe in the Good Samaritan principle, which is you help everybody. Everybody's your neighbor. You don't distinguish between right wing and left wing or religion. And I've helped all religions and all political persuasions. So, like I've, we were talking earlier, about 60% of the people that I defend, I would probably get indigestion over dinner because I wouldn't agree <laughs> with what they had to say. But there's that uh, quote that's. Um, Attributed to Voltaire, you know, I may not agree with you, but I'll go to the death to fight for what you have to say. And I think I'm a free speech purist, so I believe free speech should reign with very few limitations. I'm just, you know, I don't, I don't like what I'm seeing today with a lot of people who are getting arrested on street corners that are by police for handing out pamphlets and stuff. We see more and more of that kind of thing, which I don't like, and we defend those kind of people. So it's that background, but you know, just a, a mix of my religious viewpoints and my political persuasion and my history in the 60s, I think, really implanted something on me. How did the, what led you to found, I mean, you've explained this a little bit, the, but the, if you would extend that, the Rutherford Institute, and how did the Institute get its name? Well, I uh, originally was a, uh, worked with the ACLU very, very heavily in the 60s. Uh, and there, you know, people were all, there were a lot of folks coming to me that were, couldn't get help anywhere, even with ACLU. You know, a lot of them were, were religious folks. So originally, I, I started the institute to help people who couldn't get help. And over the years, that just broadened. I mean, it was the people who came to me, and I saw right away that there's a lot of civil liberties violations going on that no one group or no 20 groups or no 100 groups can handle. So. Uh, today, we do as much litigation as anybody in the country. We have cases all over the United States. Uh, and we work through volunteer lawyers who give their time, which is really important for lawyers to give their time because they're given so much. And, uh, you know, so uh, I named it after a fellow named Samuel Rutherford, who was a Scottish educator and divine who published a book called Lex Rex. It was burned in the streets of London. He was accused of treason because he, he attacked the divine right of kings and said the kings did not have a right to make law, they were subject to the law. Which, uh, of course, as I said, in England was treasonous. And I thought, what a neat guy to name, name uh, an organization after. But it, the thing was, on his deathbed, too, he, he, he held out. He probably would have been executed, but he died before they could get to him. That's uh, ironic. It's basically everybody's under the law, even the president. I mean, I've been involved in some controversial cases. We sued President Clinton in the Paula Jones mm -hmm. case, but the whole principle during the case was rule of law. Even It's the Bob Dylan quote, even the uh, president of the United States must sometimes have to stand naked. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that. I don't believe, I believe presidents are just like you and me. They go to the bathroom, they put on pants, dress as if they happen to be a female. And uh, we don't treat presidents like kings. They're under the law, rule of law. It's an interesting point because so often our lawmakers going all the way up to presidents are sometimes the emperor. With no they treat like emperors. You know. And I object <laughs> to that, the, the whole glamorous White House kind of thing. I, I don't think that's why America was, I mean, I, I like Abraham Lincoln who came downstairs and greeted people with no shoes on. That's my, oh, that's why I'd like to see a president do that kind of thing again. But yeah, I don't think you're going to see that. <laughs> Probably not soon. Um, <laughs> So most of the work that you do is pro bono? But... It's all pro bono. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no one gets charged. We've had cases, a case of the Supreme Court will cost $100,000 in expenses. Mm -hmm. So, And we raise our money not from large corporations. We don't, we don't have huge donors. We have our, our average donor is like $25. John, you refer to yourself as a civil libertarian. Um, for people who don't know what that's about, define that for us, if you would. Civil libertarians for everybody's rights. I don't... Uh, we have no political agenda, therefore I will defend people on the left, the right, the middle, libertarian, Republican, Democrat. I'm apolitical and the group's apolitical, so we don't politicize our agenda. So uh, I've seen some groups do that where they they want to be a Democrat or Republican. That's fine individually, but you're, uh, when, when your group does that, all of a sudden you can't defend a Republican or you can't defend a Democrat or whatever. So we don't do that. Yeah, we have enough walls. And it hurts my funding base occasionally because people will get upset and say, how can you do such a thing? Well, I believe in the First Amendment. In a democracy, how might citizens help uh, maintain the balance between supporting institutions that guide and protect our liberties while challenging those very same institutions when they too often move to limit and constrain our constitutionally enumerated freedoms? Well, one of my heroes, you asked people who influenced me, it was Martin Luther King. 
In fact, I'd say he probably has more influence over me than anybody. King's uh, idea was that uh, <clears throat> you could support governmental institutions, but when they when they were breaking the law, or had what he called an unjust law, you could, you know, as, as he did effectively, uh, you could either disobey it, get on the st you know the steps of the picket sign, and right before he was assassinated, he was planning on going to Washington and occupying Washington, basically very strongly so with the shanty town and after he died Reverend, Reverend Aber Abernathy did it anyway but uh, I think that the way you support democratic government is oppose it when it does things that are unconstitutional you just you know you, you can't uh, I, I would say every time I see something that's wrong I either write about it or if we have someone coming to us that needs help where they've been oppressed by the government you fight it legally but uh, I think citizens that way, and again, go back and look at Martin Luther King, what a tremendous impact he had because he was a great organizer, he spoke eloquently, he, his writings are amazing. Uh, and if you look at it, people accused him of being anti-government. He wasn't really anti-government, he was anti-unjust government. And so if the government appears to be unjust, and you don't have to be right, okay, uh, you, you could say government's unjust and you may be wrong, but you still have a right to get out there and protest. And again, I've defended people who... I don't agree with. <laughs> I think what they're doing is probably weird, if you want to say that, but they have a right to be on the street corner saying it and doing it. You referred to uh, King's early occupying uh, movements. Um, uh, what, was, what was the Bonus Army, and why is it, was it of particular significance in our civil rights? Yeah, the Bonus Army early on, uh, they came out of the, the First World War, and they wanted uh, pensions, and et cetera, and the Congress was not agreeing with that and so they basically occupied Washington uh, early on and that was a again I think some of that inspired Martin Luther King uh, and basically after that they General MacArthur by the way was what the general that was put in charge of running him out of Washington DC which he did pretty brutally um, so the the first bonus army was just people coming back from the war veterans that thought they deserved some kind of benefits and eventually we got those through the GI Bill and whatever but I think some of those early movements they do have influence they look like I think that they're defeated movements like the Occupy movement for example to the present occupy. it looks like it's a defeated movement but it's really not a defeated movement if its impact carries over. And I think some of its impact is going to carry over. Well, it's true. And as we all know, in the 60s, it took a while for momentum and for protests to build and yes. for people to adjust themselves to what that means. And I um, think strategy is important. Um, one thing that Martin Luther King taught me was strategy is really important. You need an identifiable leader, an identifiable agenda, and you need to have something that you're going to eliminate that's unjust and, and accomplish the elimination. It's a good point, and obviously many people have cited the, the present Occupy movement for not seeming to have a core. Um, what kinds of things might the Occupy movements do in order to make themselves more effective, in your view? Well, uh, I mean, you have to be able to understand what their agenda is. A lot of people contact me and says, what does the Occupy movement object to? <laughs> well... Uh, and a, a lo a, one of the columnists in our local newspaper wrote and said they were full of envy. And I don't think that's true. I think that um, there are a lot of things you can object to uh, locally here, cutting down all the trees uh, that I see happening. I was hoping the Occupy movement would go over and get in front of those places where I'm seeing the landscape go flat. Environmental causes are important. The cause of war. I mean, President Obama now is reigning over the biggest military empire in the history of mankind, although he's the Nobel Peace Prize winner, quote unquote. Um, there are a lot of issues that are really important that I think are life and death issues that the Occupy movement could move toward. And it affects the economic thing that they supposedly are protesting. So there are a lot of things. And again, they came over and met with me, and I said the same thing to them. Uh, what was good about King is, is he uh, strategized, he pointed, he went to the location of the problem. And what he said in the last essay that was published right after he had been assassinated was that uh, we're going to Washington and we're not going to leave. And we're going up to the Capitol steps and we're going to stay there until they pass this bill and do what we want. And he says, I can't, don't expect anything out of Congress unless you force them to act. And that's true. You have to force politicians to act. So, uh, 
what he was saying is, is I'm going to go up and we're going to go up on the steps of the Congress and we're not going to move. And what he did effectively was, and, and he said this, you have to make the system, the establishment, use a lot of energy. In other words, arrest. I mean, mass arrest, energy and stuff like that, which the Occupy Movement did for a while, but then they kind of withered away. King, though, just kept the heat on all the time. So eventually it cedes to your demands because it extends on and on, and they basically want if to your settle demands, If your demands are really good demands, I mean, mm -hmm. they're honest, moral demands, you don't give up. You mm -hmm. just keep going away. Uh, and that's the same at the Rutherford Institute. Over the years, I mean, it's been, you know, it's a struggle to keep an artist. It's going to be 30 years old uh, in June. Uh, I saw right away that if you really believe in what you do, you stay in until the end. You stay in mm -hmm. until you run the race. Mm -hmm. um, what are free speech zones and how do they affect our democracy in your view? Free speech zones, uh, basically after the 60s, early 70s, and into the 80s, started being erected. Free speech zones, I think, were a reaction to the successful movements of the 60s. The establishment, as I call it, the political establishment, had to find a way to limit it. So the idea was to create free speech zones uh, where you'd have a car domed off or a gated area where people can go and they can have their free speech there. Uh, at the, uh, what, 2004 Democratic Convention, uh, they actually put cages up and they had a, a free speech zone when Obama was speaking. And I wrote an article saying, he, he was a constitutional law professor. I said, I wrote him directly and said, you can't do this. You're a constitutional law professor. The problem with free speech zones is, is they create an area, but they're so far away from the people you want to address that they're not effective. Some colleges have actually, and we've written, colleges and got a few lawsuits where they actually like will, will find an alleyway in the back of some university and that's the free speech zone. Well the people that they want to address, the people in the free speech zone are going in the front door. Well that's not free speech. So that's what the zones are. They're to put people away from the targets of their speech. It makes, you know, again if you have celebrities, I mean Cheney was going to speak here recently, I don't know you know what the uh, at the, you know, Miller and um, when he heard that there were protesters coming, he didn't show up. But uh, with a free speech zone, if you create a free speech zone, they'd put them behind the Miller Center, and Rick Cheney could have come in the front door, and he probably would have spoken. That's why free speech is so effective. And if, to, if you wanted to limit free speech, what you do is you create a zone or put people in a cage somewhere. Well, and it, create, it, it controls uh, press coverage, which, is, which yeah. is key for communication, what's going on. So yes. um, how in the aftermath of 9-11, John, did the Bush administration affect our right to privacy, would you say? Well, with the uh, quick, uh, well, the U.S. Patriot Act was put into law within six weeks after 9-11. It's over 400-page bill, which means it was written before 9-11. There's no way it was written after 9-11. So it was some, a bill that was waiting to happen. Uh, the Patriot Act basically gutted uh, the Bill of Rights. What the Patriot Act allowed the government was to uh, do roving wiretaps. In other words, uh, the law used to be that if you were going to wiretap somebody, you had to go to a judge, get a warrant, and the judge says you can tap that telephone. Under the Patriot Act, you could do ro roving wiretaps. So once they got their right to tap your phone, they did cell phones, internet, and all those kind of things. They could follow you wherever you go. So it bypassed the, the, uh, the courts. Uh, the other thing is it allowed the groups like the FBI to come into your home without a search warrant and do sneak and peek searches. In other words, come in, go through, your, rifle through your materials, and by the way, the FBI has a new manual that we don't know what's exactly in it, but we do know it's gonna give agents the power to even go further, come into your home, go through boxes, track you wherever you go. Uh, so the U.S. Patriot Act is, uh, um, anybody who studied the law knows it got into Bill of Rights. In other words, it, it allows the government to go to your internet site download materials. It allowed the government to come into your home and use magic lanterns and put on your computer and download everything on your computer. And But, but here's the key, you never know they're there because they're good, they're good at breaking, breaking and entering and leaving without you knowing it. What are the express powers of the president uh, under the Patriot Act? Is there anything in particular that he they can get the, do? The, well, combined with the Patriot Act mm -hmm. and the new National Defense Author Authorization Act, which Obama just about. signed yeah. into, President Obama just signed the law, it, combined with that, it gives the president the ultimate power to basically detain any citizen or any non-citizen. It allows the military to come to your door ostensibly for 
uh, a non-citizen suspected of terrorism. However, if American citizens are present, and this is what the FBI Director Mueller said, it concerned him. And if it concerns the FBI, it should concern us, that if American citizens is there, it can sweep in whoever's in that house and they all go to military detention. If you follow the case of Bradley Manning, the young soldier who broke the WikiLeaks thing, and, and how he was basically tortured, he was put in a cell of isolation, he couldn't see his family, and he had minimal communication with an attorney. He was smart enough to know people who had a lawyer. Well, if you're swept into military detention and the president can do this, you're gone. You probably won't see your family, and if you're just an average citizen, you won't see a lawyer. You mentioned the FBI. Have the powers of the FBI expanded in recent years? They've expanded. Um, yeah, with, with, there's a new manual, and we don't know exactly what's in that manual. But all we know is what's been released, and it will allow the FBI to use national security letter, letters, which bypass search warrants. In other words, the FBI just shows up with letters and says, I need these documents from you. It also allows them to come into your home secretly and rifle through materials in your attic. In other words, if they don't like what you're doing, they can go try to find evidence to convict you of something. And we do know, and this is factually true, that the FBI has, in, has infiltrated different groups, pretended they're part of a group. They even have infiltrated the Quakers in Baltimore, peace activists, to see what the Quakers are up to. If you know what the Quakers are, a very peaceful group of people. But it becomes extremist and it becomes a little paranoid. So. Um, they have, you know, again, I would say, and <clears throat> I don't have any problem saying this, is that we're, we have moved into a police state. Uh, the ability of, this, of surveillance is a massive. The National Security Agency has a computer system called Acquaint. Several of the people who helped set, set up that computer resigned and said the government should not have the kind of power this computer gives the government. But what it allows the government to do is to sweep all computer systems, all text messaging, to see what you're doing. The computer does it. So technology has become so awesome that they can collect any kind of information. I tell friends, don't, they, they, I'll get a weird text message like the movie bombed. I say, don't use the word bombed on a text message because that, that computer is going to zero in on that bom word bombed and they're going to feed you right into the computer and you're a suspect at that point. It's very interesting because I have some friends from, from other countries and I, they will sometimes be quite paranoid about the degree to which they're watched and many people used to think that they were exaggerating but no. I, I There's a great line in a Woody Allen movie, The Curse of the China Jade. Some guy accused Woody Allen of being paranoid. He says, and the, the guy says, you know what that means? And Woody Allen says, yes, it means I'm very perceptive. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about the Ninth Amendment because I had uh, uh, Professor Schauer on um, to talk, talk about the Constitution in a prior program. Um, and it, it was an interesting amendment to me because it, it is rather opaque and open-ended. Um, but legal scholars tend to dismiss it. Um, what are your thoughts as to the significance of this amendment? Well, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment should be read together. What the, what the objection to the Bill of Rights was, was this. Um, and, and thank God Jefferson opposed this idea. but. The idea was if we list certain rights, the government's going to assume that the lights, the things not listed there, they had a right to invade. So the Ninth and Tenth Amendments leave rights to the people and to the states that are not listed in those amendments, so to protect every other right on the face of the earth. So that was the whole purpose of the Ninth and Tenth Amendment. Uh, and Jefferson argued, he said, "Hey, if you, get, if you get a half a loaf, it's better than no loaf at all." And so. Uh, People like Madison had enough foresight to write in the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, which guarantees the people what rights not stated the people still retain and the states return cer retain certain rights. However, uh, those are based on the concept of federalism, which means you have uh, differentiated sources of power. The federal government, um, you have, and again, it's called the federal government because of federalism. The states had a certain amount of powers in the local communities, but that exists no more because the Basically, we have a centralized government in Washington, D.C., that through funding uh, of state governments and stuff has an amazing amount of power, and the concept of federalism has basically gone away. John, do you think that um, with the increasing can protections of our rights basically keep pace with the speed at which technology is advancing? Uh, not at this point. Uh, my, my belief is that technology now is driving everything. I mean, we're not driving technology, it's driving us because it's become so awesome. You know, like it's, what is it to, to a hammer all the world? It's like, it looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. 
You know, so to a, technolo a technology system that's used to survey people, everybody looks like a suspect. So we're all suspects now. Uh, so again, you shouldn't have to be looking over your shoulder all the time, but people do. And I, again, you're, you use the word paranoia. You have to be concerned today what you say. For example, I remember some, uh, was it Scalia, one of the justices of the Supreme Court, I forget, mm -hmm. when he was up for appointment, um, they actually had a record of all the books he had bought at Barnes and Noble. And I think those I came remember out. that, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I thought, well, how absurd. This man has privacy rights. He should be able to read anything he wants to write. I mean, read anything he wants to read, but I mean, but those kind of, but it's even worse than that now. Uh, Facebook, be careful what you say on Facebook, text messaging. I mean, I was told early on, John, if you want to be a judge, be sure you don't write anything controversial. And I was going, but. They don't want to know what I really believe. They want me to hide everything I believe, be a politician. Yeah, what, what kind of leaders will we have if you water it down to people who have no opinions and well, are I think the state. current Republican debate show you what kind of leaders we get. I get <laughs> concerned about in a younger, very younger generation has no fear of putting everything out there on the Internet because I think um, they're used to it. And those of us that are a little bit older are a bit more circumspect about that. Uh, so I imagine over time, privacy law is become, going to become rather a burgeoning yep. enterprise. Yes? Yes. So, yeah, young kids, but young kids are young kids. But I'm afraid some of the things young kids are doing mm -hmm. on Facebook, I mean, we, we, we get in cases with Facebook where a young girl in gym class took a photograph of her gym teacher's buttocks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was a big controversy. I was going, oh, I hope that doesn't haunt her in 20 years yeah. when she wants yeah. to, they're going to say she showed someone's behind on Facebook. But everything's a record now. The, le the computers don't forget. Turning to our schools. Yeah. Um, in what ways are they emblematic of the problems that we face in a nation as a whole? Well, again, we handle a lot of cases in public school issues uh, here locally. Uh, we've handled cases. Um, what my great concern about with public schools today is free speech is disappearing. Uh, we have a case out in uh, California where uh, some kids brought in uh, on Cinco de Mayo Day, they brought in some American flags on their shirts. And uh, they were told to take the shirts off because it might offend some Hispanic kids. Uh, we got involved in the case I thought it was a pure free speech issue. But the thing about free speech is it does offend. But offensive speech is what's protected in the First Amendment. People uh, that don't offend are never involved in First Amendment activities. It's the people who get on the street corners and rile things up. Uh, but the idea that, oh, it might offend somebody, we've got to eliminate it. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was offensive. Martin Luther King was really offensive. Matt Henhoff was really offensive. John Whitehead is considered offensive sometimes, and maybe you're considered offensive, but that's what the free speech mm -hmm. thing protects. So we want to keep debate, robust debate. How to deal with a flag t-shirt, have, uh, have an assembly where the students can meet two weeks before and debate the issue. Schools never think like that. Um, so we're, what, I, what I feel we're doing in our public schools, we're raising a whole you know, a compliant citizenry in the future. And one re way we're doing that is the lack of proper civics teaching uh, all the studies show, and I've written on this, you can go to our website, rutherford.org, and read this. This is fact. It's footnoted. Kids graduating from high school don't even know what's in the, fir the First Amendment. They have no idea what the Fourth Amendment is. Uh, this should shock you. I have law students, about 30 students come study with me every summer from all over the country, some of the finest schools. These are good students. Uh, when they walk in the door, I ask them to give me the five freedoms in the First Amendment. Each student, I have yet to find over my entire history, any student that can give me the five freedoms of the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. These are law students. I spoke to the local bar association here in Charlottesville two years ago. In the middle of my speech, <laughs> middle of my speech, I stop and say, by the way, can, this is 150 lawyers in the room. Mm -hmm. Can any lawyer in this room give me the five freedoms of the First Amendment? One guy raised his hand. I said, be careful, I'm going to call on you. And he put his hand down. <laughs> I walked out shocked. This is America. We don't know what's in the First Amendment. Shocking. Well, very often I think that people take the machinery of government and democracy for granted and think that it will just keep chugging along, the train will keep running. And uh, obviously, you know, we're seeing examples 
all over the place in banking, sure. in environmental issues, where this isn't the case. So the people need to pay attention. You need to uh, know your rights. I often say the most three beautiful words in the English language are probably we the people. The Constitution was written so we would participate, and you have to participate. Mm -hmm. And again, go back to Martin Luther King. He participated. That's why he changed things. You can participate, but that means turning you know, all your entertainment stuff off, occasionally going to local city council meetings. I'm surprised sometimes when I see footage of our local city council meetings and it's almost bare. No one's there over an important issue. Thank God with the Occupy people, they crowded the room that night, you know, several times and voiced their opinion. But that should be every night. Where are the people at? One of the things that I've always been curious about, John, is how you strike a balance in the law. And I know this is a huge question. Uh, you, you need precedent. You need cases as guides mm -hmm. for future uh, litigation. How do you strike a balance between becoming enslaved to precedent and or allowing people to be treated as individuals on a case-by-case -case basis? Precedent is good because it gives you guidelines, but it should not be carved in stone. Red Scott, which basically approved slavery, was a Supreme Court decision. That should never have occurred, and it should have been overturned. Brown versus Board of Education advanced uh, equal rights for all Americans. So. Uh, as a lawyer, I see precedent as a guide, but should not be, you know, it should not be something carved in stone. It's not Moses coming down from the mount with the Ten Commandments. It's, it's uh, infallible human beings who make mistakes, and we do make mistakes. So whenever, I, I, my feeling is the courts are there to do justice, and people say, well, what do you mean by that? We're there to protect human rights. Whenever human rights are in the balance, whoever's on the other side uh, should be fearing the courts are going to rule against them. And I'm talking about little people on the street corner, people with picket signs, the Occupy people, whoever out there is uh, exercising their rights, because that's, that's what justice is all about. That scale should always be heavy on the side of individual freedom, because without that, uh, <clears throat> the government becomes what it's become today, a large bureaucratic mess that's filled with corruption. What, in your view, are some of the greatest victories, victories that you've experienced uh, at the Rutherford Institute in your work for free speech? I think they're all great. I mean, we've won Supreme Court cases. Uh, sometimes the greatest, the, the biggest victories are when we write a letter. When some, for example, uh, I told you about the case of the young boy who had oregano in his hand in school and the teacher thought it was simulated marijuana or whatever and kicked him out of school. Well, we intervened with a letter and said, we're going to sue you if you don't put him back in school. <laughs> and they did. See, that's a great victory for the family because the family was, to put it bluntly, freaking out. They're, he was a good student. This is going to, and he had to clean his record up. So any of those kind of things, I don't, I don't put, um, you know, any particular case in front of another. It's, they're all together, you know, plus the other groups out there fighting ACLU, you know, the groups like that doing good work. All the cases together are important. Okay, since this program is about solutions, um, what are some of the things that individual citizens can do uh, today to make their voices more heard? We, of course, writing your congressmen and senators. But what are some other things that you would suggest? Well, first, get educated. Uh, the Bill of Rights is only 462 words, so if you're a slow reader, it takes five minutes to read them. Uh, that's the first ten amendments. Uh, so get educated. Uh, we have free pamphlet. We give out a free pamphlet called "Do You Know Your Bill of Rights?" They should know the Bill of Rights. Teach them to your kids in the home if the schools are not doing it. Get your kids active. When your kids go to school and they're wearing a T-shirt that some teacher doesn't like, and it's usually a teacher, it isn't the other students and they do something that you feel violates their free speech rights, get behind them and stand up for them. Um, be involved in your local political structure. Affecting Washington, D.C. is very difficult, I know, because we sue people in Washington a lot. Even with lawsuits, it's tough. Uh, local city governments where you can make your biggest impact. And I think Occupy, the Occupy movement gave us a good example. They created a firestorm of media coverage, uh, did some good, and if they continue, they can do more good. But it, it's going to take, you have to be willing to sacrifice. And I think that's the key. You have to be willing to sometimes get arrested, get hit by a policeman, whatever it takes. And I'm not saying people should go out and do that. But what I'm saying is it takes sacrifice. It takes putting your principles on the line and standing up for freedom. And that's, that's the basis of it. I mean, it, you go back to the founding, the 1776 Declaration of Independence. It was written right here in Charlottesville. 
I mean, you're talking about people putting their lives on the line, not just their freedoms. They're putting their lives on the line. They were willing to die for freedom. And so we should be willing to take a picket sign down to City Hall, even if we're the only person with a picket sign, because Rutherford Institute will defend you if the police arrest you. Well, at the very least, civil disobedience is not treason. So, no, you know, no, that's, no, and I think Martin Luther <laughs> King was people, correct. No, yeah. no, no. Yeah, standing against unjust law, it's... That's a moral thing to do. Well, I think a lot of people in this community are aware of that because we have the Occupy Charlottesville movement. In fact, there was just a piece in the paper today about they're having to relocate and they're taking a bit of a hiatus, but uh, that gets people thinking about things. We had the Albemarle High School case of the young woman who um, was not allowed uh, to put her piece in the paper because it might offend, offend someone, and yes. then you weighed in on that. I weighed in on that. So Free speech um, is really it's important. in the air, and um, I am so delighted that you were able to come and talk to us about this today, John. Thank you at home for listening to our conversation. If you would like more information about the topic that we have discussed today, we will be posting a number of books and articles on civil liberties concerns on our website at politicsmatters.org. You will also find there a comprehensive archive of all prior Politics Matters programs, which you may watch in their entirety at any time. We are very interested in hearing from you with any and all questions and concerns, as well as ideas for future programs. We encourage you to email us at info at politicsmatters.org. We air Tuesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. on Charlottesville's Channel 13. Thank you very much, and until our next broadcast, I'm Jan Painter, and this is Politics Matters. Mm -hmm.